together one final time for all the moms. Amazing. We love you guys. Father, we come before you today, and I do lift up all the moms in the house. We thank you for their tireless efforts in raising us. I do pause for a moment and realize that uh, for some in this place, maybe their mom has already gone on to be with you. And Lord, we pray for them as they mourn their mom today, or for those ladies who might be here today who have longed to be a mom in the natural, like Hannah, who we talked about last week. Lord, would you create a miracle? Would you bring a miracle to pass for them that they could have children, whether it be naturally or through adoption, that would just be life-changing? So, Lord, we come before you with both humbled and joyful hearts as we begin to dive into your word today, as we open up the living word of God, would it transform us, would it guide us, would it direct us, would it inspire us? So this morning we dedicate the rest of this day unto you in Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Well, a sincere thank you for being here today. If you're new to Journey Church, we've been going through this one-year Bible journey. We've called it Epic, and we've really pulled about 50 different major stories of the Bible, and we're going through them, we're talking about them, we're allowing them to transform us, and today is no different. We land today in a set of scriptures from 1 Samuel. So if you have your Bible with you today, feel free to turn to that book of the Bible. Uh, last week, we talked about Hannah. It was an awesome time and the introduction of Samuel the prophet. If you missed the message, download our app. You could certainly watch it there or online at any point in time. And today we're going to kind of continue on. This is the first of a section of scriptures that's known as Kings, where we start to talk about this season in the life of the Jewish people where they wanted a natural king instead of the king of kings, which is not the greatest of things. And that's where we start to pick up the story today with the Jewish people crying out and saying, hey, we want a king. And Samuel trying to buck that in them and say, no, you don't need a king. You already have a king. And then we're going to conclude today with the amazing epic story of David and Goliath. How many of you remember that story from scripture? Anybody know that one? We all know that one. Maybe we'll see it with fresh eyes today from a slightly different perspective. So we do pick up this story in 1 Samuel chapter 8, if you have your Bibles with you today. And uh, the People are crying out for a king, and Samuel's doing everything he can to deter them from that thought. And uh, I, I wish I had like a great mafia Italian voice that I could say this in, but he's like, you want a king, you're going to get a king. You know, I don't, I'm just terrible at that, you know, but or, or that other section in scripture, maybe it would be like God where you want to eat meat, I'm going to give you all the meat you could ever eat, right? So um, I'm, those were terrible, terrible voices, but um, I'm not good at that. But, you know, when we dive into scripture today, it's clearly not their best plan. So Samuel is really trying to deter them. Let's listen to his heart for the Jewish people found in 1 Samuel 8, 19. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, but there shall be a king over us, that we may be like all the other nations, and that our king may judge us and go before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice and make them a king. It was sad. You could hear the pain really in his heart, and you'll hear it in God's heart in just a moment um, as he gives them the words that he's about to share. You see, the Jewish people were not like all other people in all other nations. They didn't need a king. God was their king. God continues to show himself strong in their life even today. While we celebrate Mother's Day here in Jacksonville in the United States, the Jewish people are celebrating the 70th anniversary of their return to Jerusalem in the Temple Mount, of which they had not visited in 1900 years. There is great jubilee and rejoicing in the miracle that is the land of Israel. God remains their king. They are not like every other nation, right? They were a set-apart people who had the God of the universe as their guide, as the one who was leading them. So they're standing there really in blasphemy saying, give me an earthly king. And I think in some ways, as you'll see through scriptures today, we do the same thing in our generation. We cry out for earthly solutions to spiritual problems, and God wants to do something in our midst and inspire us through the words that we're going to be reading today. So the first king of Israel would be a man named Saul. God appointed 
uh, Samuel to anoint him as king. And we find the story really in 1 Samuel 10, 17. Now Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mitzvah, and he said to the people of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought Israel out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hand of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you have rejected your God, who saves you from all of your calamities and all of your distresses, and you have said to him, Set a king over us. I have no doubt there was heartbreak in his words. They didn't need another judge to go before them. They didn't need an earthly solution. They had the king of the universe, and how quickly they forgot. They had just been delivered from Egypt. God was guiding them and directing them. They had experienced miracle after miracle, and yet they're saying, give me an earthly king. See, the reality is we as saved people, those who call Jesus our Lord, we are a peculiar people. We are not to be of this world. We're not to look for earthly solutions. We serve the king of a different kingdom, the king of kings and lord of lords. And sometimes we do the same things as the Jewish people, and we look for all of these earthly things. We cry out and say, Lord, could my boss save me? Lord, could my paycheck save me? Lord, would Trump save me? Or would Obama save me? Or a Democrat? Or a Republican? Or you name it. And we put these people in pedestals in places that they should never be. I call them functional saviors. We look for these functional saviors to comfort us, to get us through times and seasons. For some of you, that is the ice cream inside of your refrigerator right now, right? You say, Lord, ice cream, save me tonight. Comfort me, right? Peace. Am I the only one? Jeez, I told you I'm I'm sick, right? But we look for these things in the natural to give us these momentary spats of joy, these momentary things of peace. We find another conditional promise. We've seen a lot of these in Scripture as we've dived through the, New Te- the Old Testament so far. 1 Samuel 12, 14. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandments of the Lord, if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. God wants us to serve him. How many of us knew this? Your mama told you. I know my mama told me to do the right thing. My mama tried to raise me in the right way, but how many of you are rebellious little kids like me? Anybody else? Right? All the rest of you are do-gooders. Come on, Jesus. I'm watching you. Got you. we later. Our moms in many cases, did a great job of trying to instill that kind of a value in our life. But God looks for that in our lives as well today. And he knows that we're ill-equipped to accomplish it on our own. Because no matter how hard I tried in those young days of my life, I still went on doing all the dumbest of things. Were any of you like me? And you're willing to admit it, right? We did some dumb, dumb things. And in the natural, I too would cry out for things to save me rather than turning to the king of the universe. I think we do the same as well. See, the Israelites were always looking for some functional savior to get them through their present calamity rather than turning to the king of the universe. And this hurt his heart. There's no doubt. Samuel tried to warn them as well. If you look to these things, they're going to end in misery. Because I don't know about you, but almost every politician I've ever encountered has been corrupt. Right? Right? See, when Obama's in office, all the Republicans be saying Obama's corrupt. Now when Trump's in office, all the Democrats be saying Trump's corrupt. Guess what? They're all corrupt. Come on, Jesus. They all need Jesus, right? So we can't look to some earthly savior for something like that. We can't look to our boss to save us. We can't look to our bank accounts to save us. We can't look to some chemicals to save us. We can't look to things of the natural to save us. They're not meant to, right? But all too often we turn to those things rather than turning to the one who saved us once and for all time, who loves us, created us, and died for us, which leads us to our main story today, none other than David. David is introduced in 1 Samuel chapter 16. God's telling Samuel to anoint him to be the next king. Um, At this stage, he is but a shepherd boy, and I would like to set up the story in this way and give credit where credit is due. We were batting around these concepts inside of our staff meeting, and Kevin really brought a different perspective to me because I think I saw this story of David and Goliath through a singular set of lenses um, that maybe you have too because almost every time I've ever heard it preached or every time I've read the story, I want to be David. Any men in here want to be David, right? Like, we want to be the center of the story, right? 
We want to be the victor. We want to be the hero. None of y'all come on, Jesus. I know y'all do, right? We want to be the hero. We want to be the central figure in the story. We want to be the one who saves somebody, right? We want to be that one who goes out there and saves the nation and saves the people. We want to be Superman or we want to be Wonder Woman or we want to be the Incredibles or the Avengers or whatever's out right now and is the most popular movie on the... Why do you think those movies are so popular, right? Because we want to put ourselves in that place of being the hero of the story. But the reality of the matter, if we really get honest with ourselves, is we're a lot more like the Israelites who were cowering in the corner during the course of the story. We have our fears, and we go out there, and we see a giant like Goliath, right? So if you read on in this story, you see that you know the story. You know, there's this epic battle. All the Israelites are on one side. The Philistines are on the other side. They send out this guy named Goliath who's like eight feet tall. He's jacked up on steroids on top of it. I mean, he is just out there like ready to kill. He's all angry. You know, he's calling out the Jewish people. Who are you going to send out here? And then there's this little guy, David, right, five foot tall. And he comes out there, and he's not the one that everybody would choose. And he ends up being the victor. We're going to dive into that in a moment. But you know, we find ourselves right now at this place in the story where David is being introduced. And we pick it up in uh, 1 Samuel chapter, let's see where it is, 16. So there comes this moment where Samuel is about to anoint the next king. And uh, they call on the family of Jesse. And it says, when they came, they looked at Eliab and thought, so Samuel looks at him from the outside, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So Samuel, like you and I, go out and he's trying to pick the next king. He's trying to pick the next star quarterback, Right? And he goes out and he sees this one dude and he looks like he meets all the criteria. He's fit. He's buff. He's good looking. He's smart. He's the one that you want to pick on the team and get on there and you want him to be front and center for you. And God says, no, that's not the one I've chosen. This is what I mean by that functional savior thing. Don't we do the same? Even when we start as young as we are and you're out there on the soccer field or you're out there on the baseball field and you're starting to pick people, right? You're like, oh man, I want him on my team or I want her on my team because they're awesome. And then all of a sudden you go down and then you get kind of the end of the pecking order and there were guys like me that were standing out there that never got picked until the end, right? Yeah. The ones that are left out. So David is so left out that they didn't even invite him. They knew that they were showing up. They left him out in the field. They're like, there's no way this guy is going to be the next king. So the brothers and the father, they leave him out there still working, and they don't even bring him there to see them. That's how left out that guy was, you know. He was still out there with the stinky sheep, right? In our generation, maybe the analogy when it comes to sports is like, you know, the computer guy, the computer geek, that was me growing up. You know, you don't get picked and you're back there in the corner and you're not even invited to the game. None of you were like that. <laughs> but now some of y'all married that star quarterback and you wish you married that computer geek because they're like running Google or something. Come on, Jesus, right? So he's the left out one. And I think this, there's hope for us all because it says God sees us in a different way. He's not looking on the outward appearance as man does, but he's looking for something in our hearts. I'll reveal what that is near the end of the message, but he's looking for something deeply within us that he can use so that he can transform the world. There's a glimmer of that in each and every one of us, right? So in this story, obviously he doesn't pick the one guy, he picks the other. And I think we actually stand in good company for all of us who feel less than, for all of us who weren't pick because if you go and you look at Isaiah 53, it says, for he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire of him. Do you know who he's speaking of? Jesus. It says Jesus was like David. So what I want you to begin to see here in this story is that David really is Jesus and we are the Israelites that are standing on the sideline. I know it's much cooler to think that we're the hero of the story, but the reality is what God's trying to show us through this story is that we don't have to depend on our own strength. 
You don't have to fight your battles by yourself. There is one who will fight your battles for you, none other than Jesus Christ, the king of the universe who loves you, created you, and died for you. How amazing is that? He's there to fight on our behalf. He's the David in this story. God's revealing that to us through scripture. So yes, we have our insecurities. Yes, we have our frailties. We look at the big challenges that we're faced with in life and we want to cringe and we want to cower and we don't know how we're going to succeed and we don't know how we're going to get through it. And God says, guess what? You don't have to. Because by the end of this story, you see the Philistines running away. I'm not going to read the whole story because you know it, but obviously David and Goliath, Goliath goes out there. He starts calling them out. He starts challenging them. And this is what the devil does to us too. He starts to belittle you. He tries to keep you from your calling. He tries to keep you from your destiny. He does it to those who appear the strongest among us and those who seem the weakest. I spent much of my week with a small group of men and women who lead some of the largest churches in the southeast of the United States. And one of the sad themes was that many of these men, while standing there leading churches of thousands, their wives were there and they were barely even figuring out how to make it and couldn't understand who they even were in Christ because they were struggling because the devil's always trying to beat them up and keep them from their destiny and keep them from their calling. And he does that to you and I too. He wants to speak to you and lie to you and tell you stories and call you out and say, you're never gonna be good enough. You're never gonna be strong enough. You're never gonna have enough money. Remember those things that you did back in the past before you got saved? Everybody's gonna call you out on that. You can never serve. You can never make a difference. You can never be used. Has he ever said those kinds of things to you? He wants to keep you from your calling. But listen to how David responds when this guy's up there rattling off all of his taunts and all of his shouts. It says that David goes onto the battlefield and all the Israelites were acting this way. 1 Samuel 17, 24, all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Listen to how David boldly responds. When David said to the Philistine, you come to me with sword and spear and with a javelin, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give you the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, and the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all the assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. How awesome is that? So when we started to speak of spiritual warfare last week, we need to get this kind of boldness. Devil, who are you to come speak to me, you uncircumcised Philistine is what it says, right? Who, who are you, devil? You don't have any rights or ruling over me. You can't interrupt my marriage. You can't interrupt my life. You can't interrupt my job. You can't interrupt my finances because I serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords whose name is above every other name. And that also means that, hey, guess what? When you encounter things like cancer, when you encounter things that are challenges in life, it says in scripture that God's name is above every other name. He's the one that created it. So cancer must bow, sickness may must bow. All these things must bow and kneel. It says, in fact, in Scripture that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, right? So we need to start taking authority with things like that and say, devil, you are a liar. Get thee behind me, Satan, in the name of Jesus so that we can walk forward in might and in power. Because before you know of it, David's bringing out that little stone and he whips it and it hits that big old knucklehead right in the middle of the head. And it takes him out, and all the Philistines and the devil are on the run. Why are we letting him talk all this trash to us, keeping us sick and keeping us afraid and keeping us on the sidelines? It says the kingdom of God is on a forceful advance and that God wants to use you and me to advance the kingdom of God in our generation. So right now is the time to switch some gears and start chasing after those Philistines and put the devil on the run instead of staying on the run and staying afraid. Y'all don't look too convinced of this just yet. But I'm here to tell you what I am saying is absolutely true. It's absolutely true. Why do we let them beat us up so? Don't you want to see victory in your family? Don't we want to see our sons and daughters come to know the Lord? 
Don't we want to see our friends set free from whatever binds them and holds them back from being all that they could be in Christ Jesus? The power is in you, and God is fighting for you is what it says. So you try to do it in your own power, and guess what? You will not be successful. I've tried. It doesn't work. Some of you are here, and you're in that boat. There's some things you're going through right now that you want to be victorious over, and you can't because you've been fighting it in your own power. May today's story inspire you to turn it over to Jesus that he could begin to fight the battle on your behalf so that you will see the victory. I mentioned earlier that I would tell you what God's looking for. What did he see in David and what is he hoping to see in you and I? Acts 13, 22. And when he had removed him, being Saul, he raised up David to be their king of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. He's looking for people like you and I who would say, God, I love you. God, I want to serve you. God, I will do everything for you. I will surrender my entire life to you. From this moment forward, I'll do that. And many of you are acting that out. Praise God, continue to live in there. But some of you right now, you're feeling a little bit like a pretender. You call yourself a believer in Jesus Christ, and I have no doubt that you are. You surrendered your life to him, but you're struggling, and you're just going through the motions, and you're trying to get through your day, and you feel like that's not really you. Let me tell you why. It says this in Scripture. I like to give both sides of the coin. Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? See, we all need a form of heart surgery. We all need our hearts to be transformed because I don't know about you, but in the natural apart from Jesus, my heart wants to take me to some places it shouldn't go. See, I've been a Christian since May 31st of 1992, but even at this particular stage in my Christianity as a pastor, there's stuff that comes into my mind that I wish would never go there. Like, Lord, why am I still dealing with some of this dumb stuff after all of these years? It says the battle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities in heavenly places. You hear scriptures like Paul saying, I do the, uh, you know, the things that I want to do, I don't seem to be able to do. I, I need you, oh God. And it, because these sins that beset us, that come from our old life and our old life easily go away, right? And the devil wants to jump on top of that and he wants to lie to us and he wants to keep us down and keep us from our callings and keep us from our destinies in life. So there's always these doubts in these moments in each of our lives, no matter how long you've been a Christian, that want to creep up that lead back to that, that lead back to the old us, that lead back to us before we were in Christ Jesus. So before I came to know the Lord, I didn't really care, sorry mom and dad, about some of the stuff that I did back in the day because there was no check in my spirit. I could do whatever I wanted to do whenever I wanted to do it, right? The check I had in the spirit was my mom saying she was going to whoop me, but she never whooped me. She needed to whoop me back in the day. That was part of the problem, right? But apart from Christ, there's no check in our spirit. You, you go out there and you do whatever you want because your heart is dead, and we don't often see it that way. And then we become believers, and then guess what? God does something beautiful and something new. Listen to what it says in Scripture in Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 24. It says, For I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you from the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all of your impurities and all of your idols. What does that mean? When you come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and many of you have already experienced this, there was that day you surrendered your life to him, and then all those sins were flooding up and all the stuff that you were feeling bad about, all of a sudden, it felt like it was washed away, white as snow. That's what he's describing there. By the blood of Jesus, by the cleansing of the word, God does something inside of us where we know that our sins are forgiven, and it gives us the power to move forward in that. And he says, he frees us from all of our idols. What do I mean by that? Remember I talked about functional saviors just a little bit earlier? All those things in the natural that we try to lean on for our hope that end up hurting us later, he wants to free us from those things, those strongholds in our life. 
For me, one of those big ones was drugs and alcohol. I would seek comfort in those things rather than seeking comfort in the king of kings. But what happens is you always need more. There's not enough money to fill up all of our bank accounts. There's not enough alcohol for all of us to drink. There's not enough drugs for all of us to do. There's not enough women for all of us to be going after. All of these things that tie us and bind us up in the natural, let me tell you, they all end in misery. They all end with regret. They all end with guilt. They all end with a hangover. And if you're still pursuing some of those, even as a believer, God wants to help you. He wants to help you. He wants to free you. You don't have to do it in your own strength. God will replace that heart of stone with a heart of flesh. And it doesn't mean that all your problems and challenges will go away in an instant. For some, it happens like that. Praise God when that miracle happens. And that way for others, the miracle comes in the process of God working in your life by the power of the Holy Spirit to cleanse you from those things, to grow you up, to help you be the person he wants you to be. So here's the big difference maker. Verse 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put in in my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. What that means is, guess what? You can't do it on your own. Apart from him, there's nothing inside of us that seeks to do the right thing on a regular basis all the time, right? He's saying, but by his power by his might by the anointing of the holy spirit god can do something in us that changes our very desires that we would pursue the things that are important to him see before becoming a christian miami was a pretty crazy place i thought you got saved and you had to go bowling and wear weird clothes and never drink or never do anything you know i thought you born again people were really weird is what i'm trying to say and some of us are Whatever your worst nightmare is of what you think people should be is what I thought Christians were, right? Sorry for anybody who loves the bowl. I I apologize. But um, I think you get the point. But it doesn't have to be that way. See, what happens is I get to do all the things that I ever hoped for or dreamed for without having a hangover by experiencing true joy and true peace and true hope that can only come from a relationship with him where when I sought those things in the world, they always came with guilt, they always came with regret, they always later came with pain. And God wants you to experience that today. So maybe you're that one who's on the sidelines, you're that one who sees the battle ranging around and you're just afraid right now. God brought you here for such a time as this. He brought you here for this very moment. So here's how we'd like to close. I wanna worship God in song just one more time together. There's gonna be communion elements to both my left and my right. The band's gonna come back out here and we're gonna have one more time of, where's the band? (laughs) Hey band, Um, the band's gonna come back out here and we're gonna worship God in song. There they go, there we go, hallelujah, thank you Jesus. You don't want me to sing, I promise you that. It just would not go well. Um, So we're gonna worship God with one more song. During this song, I just ask you to contemplate the words that you hear, contemplate that you've already heard through the course of the message that was preached today. If you'd like to take communion by yourself or with your family, the communion elements are both to my left and my right. And if you need personal prayer, myself, Mary Jo, others will be up here. We would love to join hands with you. We would love to pray for you and pray with you and pray that God would give you the breakthrough that you're looking for right here this very day that if you're struggling in some area, God would set you free, that you could walk forward from here this Mother's Day, just excited about the rest of the day and what lays before you in the days ahead, that God would replace whatever coldness of heart still remains in our hearts with that heart that would seek and long after him. Would you rise with me? Let's sing one more song of worship.
you restore every heart that's broken great are you Lord it's your breath
to do what is right, but we seemingly can't do it, right? And uh, we talked about this scripture in Ezekiel, which prophesies this kind of moment where we find ourselves at right now, where God will create in us a new heart and replace our old heart and instill us with a new spirit. Many of you have experienced that. You're believers in Jesus Christ. Your lives have been changed. That's why you're here this morning. You've been transformed. Others of you maybe are hearing this for the first time and you're like, wow, this is amazing. And you feel like God's been touching you and speaking to you in this service. And guess what? He has. He's been wooing you and drawing you to this very moment. Maybe it was your mom or dad or brother or sister or friend who invited you here. But guess what? You've encountered a divine appointment. God brought you here on purpose so you could hear the things that have been shared because he loves you that much that he wants to save you, that he wants to transform your life, and he wants you to live for him and serve him all the days of your life. So if that's you, I want to pray for you in just a moment. If you're ready to say, God, you are my Lord. From this moment forward, I will serve you. I want to pray for you personally. Others of you, you are believers. Your salvation is secured. But if you're honest, the kind of words that we just sang in this song, you know, is he the breath of every breath of your life? Is it something that you've been seeking hard after all the time? Or has a lot of other stuff really gotten in the way of late? And today's a day where you just know that when you sang those words, there was something new there. That you just said, man, this is real. This is true. This is what I want for my life. And you need to overcome some stuff to make that fully happen. I want to pray for you too. So if today's the day you want to dedicate or rededicate your life to God, I don't want you to miss this moment. If that's you, would you do me a favor? Everybody's looking. It don't matter. Come on, Jesus. Would you do me a favor, if that's you and you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to God, just put your hand up real high right now. In first service, there are many people. I see your hand and yours. Are there others today? Today's a day of dedication or rededication. If that's you, do me a favor. Put that hand up real high so I could see it. Thank you, Lord. If you raised your hand, I want you to do me a favor. Maybe you didn't and really wanted to. I promise you, I will not embarrass you in any way. I'm going to just join hands with you and pray for you. So if today's your day of dedication or rededication, run right up here to the front. I'd be glad to pray with you. Everybody else, give them a big round of applause. Come on up, brother. God bless you. So glad you're here. Stand right here. There are others. Come on, sister. So glad you're here. God bless you. Glad you're here today. Come on. Come on over here. Father, we just join with my brother and sister here today, and we just can't thank you enough that you are at work in their lives and in ours as well. And Father, we join with them with great gladness and celebrate with the angels in heaven as they just declare that Jesus, you are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life that they're experiencing in this very moment what was prophesied in Ezekiel, that their sins would be washed away as far as the east is from the west. They would walk from here as white as snow, Lord, that they would just feel no more pressure or guilt from their sins, that they would be behind them, and that you would empower them by the Holy Spirit, even as we read, to desire the things of you, that from this moment forward, We declare together that, Jesus, we will serve you with all our heart, strength, soul, and mind. Father, empower us by the Holy Spirit. Forgive us by your blood. We love you. We honor you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Give them a big round of applause. we got some folks who will give you some next steps materials as you go back to your seats. Everybody else, I hope you had a great day. Thank you for celebrating part of your Mother's Day with us. Go tell the world about Jesus. Have a wonderful day.